Great. Uh, so I think we can probably start uh, with the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for joining uh, this uh, seminar from the Cambridge Studies Unit. Uh, before going into the seminar and the introduction of uh, our speaker, I want I want to thank uh, the sponsors of uh, our unit for their support, uh, in particular Invenia Labs, Microsoft Research, Arm, AstraZeneca, Cambridge Innovation Capital, IQ Capital, Second Mind, and uh, Schlumberger. Um, today's talk is by sorry, <laughs> I forgot to change the name. It's a uh, uh, Javier. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Manuel Gomez. Sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he's going to talk about decision making with machine learning. Manuel uh, studied electrical engineering at the PhD at Stanford. He was a postdoc also at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, and he's now faculty at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems uh, in Germany. Uh, he develops human-centered machine learning models and algorithms for the analysis, modeling, and enhancement of social information and networked systems. He has received uh, several recognitions for his research, including uh, many uh, paper awards. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for uh, joining today. And I am going to stop sharing and... Uh, let me see uh, here. Yeah, I think now, Manuel, if you want to share your slides, uh, we can go with the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually. Uh, let me just share the slides. Um, Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, first, I would like to start um, uh, thanking uh, my co-authors, um, uh, Eleni Stratori, Luke Van, and Nastran Okati, and this work wouldn't have been uh, possible without them. So, um, but I would like to tell you a little bit uh, today about um, it's about decision support systems and uh, machine learning. So uh, many, uh, for some of you, maybe this is uh, already kind of uh, well known, no? But uh, a bit idea is that machine learning uh, promises a new generation of automated decision support systems. No, that is, uh, for example, in health, if you would think of a radiologist that use a machine learning system that helps uh, her assess whether an image uh, uh, is uh, somehow there is some sign of some kind of disease or something like that. Uh, there are in many other domains like hiring or things like injustice or even in content moderation that you would say there is a decision support system that is helping a decision maker to solve a task uh, more efficiently and more accurately. So in machine learning, uh, in general, most of the work, uh, they focus on a setting that is quite simple, no? that they, they focus on settings whether the decision is kind of binary or is uh, maybe several classes, like several options. And um, you would say this is a classification task. And uh, a bit idea here, uh, what you can see in the screen is like a bit of an idealized example, but it's just to make the point uh, if you would have uh, some instance, some data sample, uh, in this case, it's a photo of a track, let's say. And uh, this instance is represented by some features, uh, the features X, no? And this is what uh, some representation of your data, and this is what a classifier is going to uh, actually receive as an input. And a bit idea is that uh, this classifier is going to try to predict um, uh, some, some label, in this case, uh, uh, what is in the image. No? And in this case, we say this uh, Y prime, that would say it's a bus. No? Uh, and additionally, it may happen that provides some explanation for this prediction, that provides some, some confidence level for this prediction. And uh, all this uh, is what uh, uh, the human decision maker receives. No? And uh, a bit idea is that given this uh, prediction from the classifier with potential explanations, confidence, the human is asked to pick uh, one label. Uh, for the data sample. And in this case, uh, the human somehow is able to recognize that the, the classifier was making a mistake. Uh, and instead of uh, predicting bash, no, predicts a track that is this uh, a y hat. No? And in this case, the human is able to uh, actually succeed as, um, 
at uh, predicting this uh, this label track. So maybe if you pay attention to to what I was uh, uh, saying, no, is that uh, here a bit uh, the idea, no, is that uh, in in many of the uh, studies, many of the related work in this area, is uh, this problem not that the human needs to understand when to trust a prediction made by the classifier. So in this case, no, that uh, we saw as an example that the classifier was uh, predicting something that was incorrect, and um, we rely on uh, somehow the explanations. Uh, the confidence level that the classifier predict, or let's say that the human looks at the image and say, oh, this is not uh, really a bus, but it's a track. Um, we rely on that uh, for the human to actually uh, be uh, um, somehow having a good performance. And this follows from the fact that in general, no, the accuracy of a classifier may differ across samples. Uh, may happen that some classifier is very good at uh, recognizing certain type of images and is always right. Um, but in many other examples may happen that it's wrong. No? And uh, the idea is that uh, there is um, it's necessary for the human to recognize that in a way. No? Because otherwise may happen that um, the human working alone on the task is actually more accurate, takes better decisions than uh, the human that uh, uses a, a classifier, but somehow um, starts to make mistakes in samples that wouldn't have made a mistake without uh, this classifier. So in this context, no, there are tons and tons of uh, empirical studies um, that happened in the last years that they try to analyze uh, how different factors, for example, the model confidence, the model explanations, um, the calibration of a model, and how all this is conveyed to the uh, decision maker um, is influencing uh, uh, trust, no? whether the person actually trusts uh, the machine. And um, one of the issues is that if you check the literature, uh, you realize the empirical findings are uh, some kind of mixed. It's not that you would say, oh, if you do this exactly or you present predictions in this way with this type of explanation, uh, then the human is able to recognize when to trust the system. And uh, besides, it uh, seems to depend quite a lot on the application domain or even the interfaces or how, how these things are, are visualized. So it's not uh, yet like a solve uh, thing. Um, how to make sure that experts really understand when the classifiers or machines in general are making errors and to avoid that they, they develop a misplaced uh, trust in the system. By the way, at, at any time, because uh, here I cannot, it's not like a room that I can see the faces and I realize, or oh, whether somebody is asking a question or something like that, feel free to just interrupt me if uh, something is not clear or, or you want to ask something. So uh, what is our goal? So um, based on all this that uh, I just uh, uh, was describing of uh, this uh, problem of misplaced trust, trust uh, what we want to do is to design decision support systems that do not require humans to actually understand when to trust the recommendations to improve their performance. No, so here is the idea is that we want uh, that uh, the human doesn't have to decide when to trust the system or when not to trust the system for the system to be always helpful, meaning that the system can never hurt the performance of a human. Okay. And uh, here the idea is uh, the following, no? that uh, what we will do is that uh, instead of trying to solve uh, the prediction task that the human uh, needs to solve, or in general, uh, beyond prediction task, you can imagine instead of trying to mimic what the human uh, is supposed to solve and afterwards explaining to the human how the solution was acquired, we will try to just simplify the task that the human expert aims to solve. And uh, here again, the, the distinction is that the existing decision support systems, typically they try to solve the task the human expert uh, is required to solve. And then the idea is, oh, the human has to decide whether the how they weigh this solution in comparison with the solution that they would do in their own. So we don't want to do that. What we want to do is to try to simplify the task. And a bit the idea is that may happen that the, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, is not able to simplify the task at all when it is not accurate so that the human has to solve the original task. But if the algorithm is very good, we would like that it's able to actually simplify the task very much so that the human doesn't have to do almost anything. And uh, this kind of conceptual idea of saying, oh, uh, trying to aim for simplification rather than a solution uh, is kind of general. 
Uh, in this talk, I will focus on one uh, instantiation of this idea, but we have other works whether we, under this kind of general, uh, let's say, paradigm, uh, we, we solve other problems. And I'm happy if you drop me an email to point you at more papers. So in this case now, in this particular setting of a multi-class classification is what I'm gonna uh, talk about in this talk. So if we, we revisit a bit the example I gave before, no, that was this toy example, um, you have uh, here a data sample, no, and uh, again, that can be represented by some set of features. And this is what um, auto, our automated decision support system is uh, kind of receiving as an input. But in this case, how, how it works, is that the, the support system is not gonna try to predict directly uh, one single label, but it's gonna try to recommend a set of labels. Okay, in this case, track, car, and bus. And here, what the human is uh, intended to uh, is asked uh, to do is to say, you have to always pick one label within the set, whatever you think is more similar to what is in the actual image. So, um, in this way, no, the, the human again is asked to pick uh, one prediction within the set. And in this case, since the set contains track, um, the human uh, picks track and is able to, to solve the task. But um, a bit here, the idea now is that uh, we, we don't ask the human to say, uh, oh, uh, given this predicted label, uh, you can decide what you choose. We rather say pick one among the set. We are very confident that the true label is within this set. So in a way, the, the human doesn't, under, doesn't need to understand when to trust the system. And a bit the idea is that these sets, they can be of variable items, meaning that, for example, if we would recommend as a set, the set of all possible labels, we know for sure the true label is there, but we wouldn't simplify the task for the human. The human will be asked to pick one label among all possible labels. If it turns out we are, the system is very certain, we'll recommend a smaller set so that the, it's very certain the true label is there, but it's still simplifying the task for the human. So, but here is the point, no? that if we are asking uh, the human to always pick, a, a, to predict one label from the set, we have to make sure that the recommended subsets are somehow trustworthy, no? that they, most of the times happen that the true label is within the set, because otherwise, uh, would be kind of nonsense if you have a system that is all the time picked from the set, but the set uh, many times doesn't contain the true label, the, the human would think the, the whole thing is not really working. So uh, how are we going to do that? No, like, um, I, I don't know if, um, well, it's very easy to ask in um, <laughs> in Zoom, like how many of you are familiar with the, the, the area that is like in the last years became a bit more popular that is called conformal prediction? Who um, Maybe in the audience, I don't know, you can raise a hand or something virtually. Okay, I, I guess can man, I know man, I guess he's familiar with that, but I'm not sure if others. Um, People can raise hands. Yeah. Yeah, I guess some other person, the others, I'm not sure if they are there or not, but somehow, okay, three people already heard about that. Um, okay, uh, four people, seems. Okay, uh, Anyway, uh, I, I'm going to revisit a little bit, uh, and I will keep in mind some of you already know what is conformal prediction. No? So um, what is conformal prediction is a way uh, to build this kind of trustworthy recommended subsets. Okay? And um, I, I will tell you first what, what do we mean by trustworthy, and after I will tell you how, how does it work. No? So if uh, you pick any classifier f hat, this can be a neural network, can be anything, can be a logistic regression, can be whatever you want, a decision tree, doesn't matter, can be whatever. No, so um, I think um, there's a question here. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, the question is, in relation to this track bash classification task, is not ranking confidence of the different labels enough? Um, you will see that this uh, somehow ranking confidence is a starting point, and you will see conformal prediction is doing kind of that. But when you rank, um, usually you would say, oh, I, I give the top K options in confidence, no, is something that you could say. But if you do that, that the top K is kind of fixed, the K, um, you wouldn't be able to guarantee what I'm gonna write, uh, what I'm gonna show you now, no? So the conformal prediction, what it does is in a way choosing smartly the K for each sample, so that they, oh, for some samples it's showing the top one based on the confidence, for other samples, the top four, the top seven, and somehow the way that you calibrate that, meaning the way that you choose 
when you show top one or top seven or top three is in a way that you want to guarantee that with certain probability, the true label is in this top. No? So uh, you, you go into the right direction, Michael, but you will see that the conformal prediction is trying to do that in a bit of a smarter way. And one of the baselines that uh, I will show in the experiments is exactly what you are uh, referring to, or, or I think what you are referring to. Okay. I, I have a question as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so here, even with the calibrated set, you still the human still has to make a prediction, uh, make a decision, right? Yeah. So it's just that the human doesn't have to model when to test the system or not. Exactly. So, so it's so why is but but still there is some decision to be made. Can the human uh, randomly just pick something or how exactly what goes into the uh, making this decision? And why is this uh, second approach of using conformal predictions and uh, uh, this pick, this decision better than the previous one? It, it, I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying that is. You will see now, but it's more predictable in the sense that uh, if it is up to the person to decide whether to use the predicted label or not, um, you don't know. Some people will just use the predicted label, some others they, they will not. But uh, a bit the idea is that it will be quite difficult to uh, uh, actually um, to make sure that by using the system, a person doesn't become worse. No, that is like, um, oh, that by using the system turns out makes more mistakes than if they wouldn't use the system. Ah, I see. So this here by way, construction, yeah. we are going to make it in a way that if it turns out would be damaging, the system will decide to always recommend all possible labels. Right. So Even if they, the human is adversarially picking uh, the label, is that how it is? Uh, or like you will be no matter what decision the with which the human picks the label no, no. from the human. We will not take into account adversarial, but taking into account, uh, let's say, if you would say the confusion matrix of the human solving the original classification task, not that you would say, oh, the type of mistakes that this human is doing. So given that knowledge, that you would say, oh, now if um, if I have a knowledge of how the human is actually making mistakes. I will try to optimize the conformal predictor so that um, we can guarantee that it's going to always help. But I'm not saying that the human is acting adversarially. But if the human doesn't know exactly what to do with the prediction in the in the more standard setting, when you recommend a predicted label, it's not that the human is adversarial. It's that the human doesn't know what to do with that single option that you give. The human gets instructed, this is what the machine thinks, and this is the confidence level of the machine. But then it's up to the human to decide, oh, should I just uh, predict that thing, or should I predict something else? Here, what we instruct the human is to say, you have to pick one out of this set. So it's right. a bit uh, a different question for the human. Right. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry to hold you up. So are you still assuming that the human understands how the model is making mistakes in the sense no. that, okay. No, we, All we don't. Right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, in conformal prediction, now you have like a, a classifier, um, F, as I said, can be anything. And you have some calibration set that is some data that is somehow uh, coming from the same distribution as the typical data that you would uh, try to actually classify. No? And um, the type of guarantee that the uh, um, conformal prediction is giving you is to say you can choose a parameter alpha, that is what is called, one minus alpha is called the target probability. And conformal prediction is going to ensure that uh, with a high probability, the probability that the true label is in the recommended subset is somehow very close to one minus alpha. That uh, a bit idea would be, okay, I'm changing the sizes of these prediction sets in a way so that in average across all the distribution, uh, I can tell that uh, oh, the true label is with probability one minus alpha within the sets that I'm providing. Okay. And uh, here, um, <coughs> if, if you notice now, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, conformal prediction, usually the guarantee that of conformal prediction that is more common is to say um, that you don't condition on the calibration set. That you would say, oh, the probability that um, the true label is in the prediction set um, in average across all possible uh, data samples and in average about all possible choices of calibration set is one minus alpha. 
But in this case, there is another guarantee that is uh, this pack guarantee, like with high probability one minus delta, that is conditioned on the calibration set. Um, and this will be necessary in our case uh, because we want to optimize the value of alpha. Okay. Um, for those of you interested, uh, I can talk offline about that because for, for others that never heard about conformal prediction, this may seem a bit uh, odd. Okay. Um, so uh, that is the type of guarantee that we'll have, no? that we'll say, oh, we can make sure that we choose an alpha value that typically you would like that is quite small. So to say, okay, 99% of the times happen that the prediction sets contain the true label. And this is what uh, we, we call trustworthy, no? because we can guarantee with high probability the true label is in the prediction set. And uh, now no, to tell you a little bit how conformal prediction works, no? Um, uh, how, how does it uh, construct these uh, recommended subsets? And this is uh, uh, somehow um, will resemble a bit maybe the idea of the question that was raised uh, before about confidence levels. No? So uh, the way that uh, one starts is to say you take uh, all the samples in the calibration set, okay? And imagine that you are a classifier, but this is just to make it a bit easier to understand. Imagine that you, you focus on a classifier that pro produces, gives you like a, soft mask outputs, no? that you would say for every possible label, um, you have like a label value, you have actually a, a, a value between zero and one, okay? Or not between zero, and, well, all the sum to one, but let's say it's a, a, some value between zero and one that uh, across all label values sum up to one. And uh, what you can see here is that for each calibration, um, for each uh, sample in the calibration set, you compute this soft max and a, uh, one minus this of max is going to be your, what is called the conformal score. That you would say, if you have conformal score zero, would mean that your soft max is one. Means you are super certain that this is the true label. Okay? And if you do that, will happen that uh, there is the true label having some conformal score, and there will be all the other label values that they will have a conformal score. So what you record here is the conformal score of the true labels for all points in the calibration set that you can think if your classifier is very accurate, um, many of them will be close to zero. And if it is uh, more inaccurate, it will be closer to uh, one, some of them, okay? And once you have all these uh, conformal scores, no, of the calibration set, um, what uh, we are gonna do is to say, we just uh, order them. Uh, imagine there, the, the things that show up here on the, on the left in blue would be the, the points in the, in the calibration set that you are super certain that the classifier is super certain because they are very close to zero. Uh, these other points would be points that the classifier is not certain because turns out the true, um, the true label had a conformal score close to one, let's say, so that the softmax was close to zero. And what you do here uh, now is to compute the quantile um, that is as follows, no? that you would say, if you give me a value of alpha that is uh, very small, let's say 0 0.1, would mean that the, what you do here is roughly you take 90% of the, of the points in order and you uh, quantile would be just the value of the conformal score of the one at the bottom of this 90%. So in a way, you know that the 90% of your samples in the calibration set, uh, they have uh, for the true label a conformal score that is higher than the Q alpha, or lower, sorry, than the true alpha the Q alpha. So in a way we tell you, okay, uh, typically in your uh, distribution for this specific classifier, um, the true labels, um, the conformal score is gonna be smaller than Q alpha, okay? So once you have that of the Q alpha, now what, you, what do you do uh, to create these uh, recommended subsets? Is if you receive a sample uh, X, what you do is to say, you evaluate the conformal score of this sample for all possible label values. And you just uh, select all label values whose conformal score is smaller than Q. And uh, here in the example, no, if you would have that the, the green and the red, uh, turns out the softmax is uh, like higher than one minus Q, that is the quantile, you would say, oh, you recommend uh, Y prime and one pri prime as your recommended subset. And if you do that, it turns out that you can guarantee, oh, with probability one minus alpha will happen, the true label is there. But intuition would be the fact that if you do that, basically you are saying, well, since 90% of the conformal scores are smaller than Q alpha, I'm gonna just take 
all the label values whose conformal score is smaller than Q alpha. And in that way, you can guarantee, oh, you will uh, actually have the, the true label in the prediction set. Okay. And uh, a bit the idea is that it uh, turns out that if you are classifier is, uh, is not very good, uh, uh, this value Q alpha uh, will end up being uh, actually quite high and uh, oh, yeah, quite high. And uh, the conformal scores uh, will be, there will be more labels that actually are smaller than the quantile and you will end up recommending bigger subsets, no? Because you cannot really be very confident that, oh, the true labels actually are uh, the ones that they, they have, only the true labels, they have low conformal score. Okay. So uh, here, here is, uh, I, I guess, the main idea of, uh, of our work is that given a fixed calibration set, no? There will be some values of alpha of this, uh, uh, target probability that you would say with probability one minus alpha, you know the mm -hmm. true label is there. There will be some values that will lead to greater success probability of our expert. Mm -hmm. no, in, in, some somebody is talking, or I don't know if it is muted. Um, I, I guess it's not a question. It's just that I think one of you, Bihari, maybe <laughs> is not muted. Yeah. Could we have everyone muted except uh, Manuel? Okay, well, oh, if somebody wants to ask a question, can unmute that, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, a bit the, the intuition now would be to say, oh, if uh, you put us a uh, value alpha to choose zero uh, and your classifier is not perfect, um, you will predict uh, always the entire set of labels. And uh, then the, the person will have, uh, the decision maker will be as accurate as if the person wouldn't use the system, no? because you are not, really narrowing down alternatives or anything like that. You are just predicting the entire set of uh, labels. And uh, they will be, if uh, you are uh, somehow start to say, oh, you don't want coverage like 100%, but you want to say, oh, with 90% probability, the, the true label is in the set, uh, you will start to recommend smaller subsets so that the person is an easier task. But the, there will be a point that if you try to really uh, increase the value of alpha too much, sure, the sets will be very small, but there will be many times that the true label is not in the set and you will make the person to actually make mistakes that maybe then do otherwise, okay? So uh, in a way, there is a sweet spot, no, that you would say there is some, some value of alpha that maybe actually the one provided a greater gain. And a bit the idea, no, is that uh, if you remember alpha um, is uh, used to compute this empirical quantile, like the value that you would say, oh, one minus alpha percent, uh, or proportion of the of the samples in the calibration set, uh, uh, what is the value of the conformal score? No, so uh, a bit the idea is that uh, this uh, empirical quantile can only take n values if you have n samples in the calibration set, because uh, at the end is like the value of the conformal score of one of the points in the calibration set. So in a way, we only have to search over n values for alpha, okay? Because of this. Uh, reason that the empirical quantile can take only n values. And uh, so uh, the, the problem we want to address then is to say, oh, we would like to choose the, the best alpha so that the success probability of the human using our system is the highest, okay? And we know already that one of the values that is alpha equals zero uh, will be the baseline. That would be when the system doesn't do anything, okay? But uh, hopefully there will be another value of alpha that is better than alpha zero. So uh, here is one of the things, no, that uh, if you notice there, this uh, success probability of the human using our system, how do we actually estimate that? We have to be able to, to estimate that, no? And um, a bit uh, the idea that uh, we came up there is uh, the following, no? That um, I guess maybe I can ask again the, um, a question like what I asked before for conformal predictions. How many of you heard about the uh, the multinomial logic model or in general discrete choice models? Okay, now I think if I, okay, there is one person. Um, I don't know if, it's okay, uh, one person, okay. So um, so discrete choice models now is um, in general, multi, a multinomial logic model is one example, I guess a super classical, example of a discrete choice model, no? And what is this discrete choice model is in general, 
uh, is a huge uh, field that uh, is all about how try to model how people decide among alternatives. No, if you give uh, several alternatives and you would say, oh, can you model the probability that a person will pick one of these alternatives out of a set? Okay, and this is something that we didn't come up uh, with ourselves, uh, but is that we use it in this context. No, that uh, a bit the idea what we are uh, we want to model is the let's say the success probability that uh, for if we present a prediction set with uh, certain labels, what is the success probability of a human in average? So here, what you can think is the spider array here uh, for each sample X and Y. In reality, if you see this, uh, the probability of success given uh, that the true label is in the prediction set, this expression will not depend on X, will not be depend on the specific sample, but depends on the set of label values that are in the prediction set. And here, what we are uh, thinking conceptually is uh, to just say, oh, what we are going to model is the expert preference for a label Y prime whenever the true label is Y. That um, in a way, now what uh, you can tell here is that uh, we can view this true label Y as the context in which the expert chooses among labels. That you would say, oh, for all samples, when the true label is Y, eh, this is the probability that they pick Y prime. And this is what this expression tries to model. No? That eh, is this eh, based on the eh, these parameters no, that we call here the expert preference for label Y prime when the true label is Y. No? But eh, here, something that may be eh, a bit more familiar for you no, eh, as working in machine learning is that I'm sure many of you computed a confusion matrix before. No? Who, uh, I, I mean, I guess it's uh, a bit ridiculous to ask, but I guess confusion matrix ring a bell for most of you. Okay, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, I guess was more a question to know who is uh, in front of the screen or something. Okay, so a bit idea now is that you could say when you think of a confusion matrix, in a way you are saying uh, whenever the true label is Y, what is the probability of choosing any of the possible um, label values? No. So in a way, this uh, parameter u that uh, we wrote in the expression before, um, what you can think of it is like the logarithm of the uh, confusion matrix entry. Because in a way, if you see this expression, if you put in the u uh, the logarithm, um, cancel the exponential and the logarithm, and what you are just saying is, if it turns out the prediction set is the entire set of label values, this expression is just the confusion matrix. Okay, That you would say, oh, with probability 70%, you will choose the true label if the true label is Y or whatever, no? And um, a bit the idea is that um, what uh, we do with that is to say, in a way we are uh, modeling uh, how the confusion matrix gets reweighted when we actually change the prediction set to be a subset of the label values. And the way that gets reweighted is following this uh, multinomial logic model from this uh, literature of discrete choice models. No, and the, the main assumption here it's better to, to actually uh, give it with an example. No? Uh, what is this model actually doing? So um, imagine now that you have uh, this example that you would say the true label is track. And it uh, turns out that um, now you would say, oh, you recommend to the person track, car, and bus. Okay? You have this prediction set. And turns out for this prediction set, um, the human half of the times would choose a track. And, um, 25% uh, of the times would choose bus. And this is across all um, samples in, in which you recommend track, car, and bus as prediction set. So if you see there, there is a, in this a, a specific prediction set, you would say, oh, the human is uh, twice as likely as to choose track than bus. Okay. So what this uh, model is assuming is that uh, if you would increase, you would increase the choices, meaning that now one of the actual um, classes in the prediction set you add tank. In relative terms, a uh, track will still be um, twice as likely to be chosen as bus. But uh, the, the actual values could be reweighted because uh, you added another alternative. So it may happen some people actually choose tank and before they wouldn't choose it because it's not there. No? So uh, a bit of the this um, this uh, is a property of this MNL that we also somehow uh, have experiments to try to say, oh, how um, you know, sensitive we are to violations of this property. You know, that uh, all of a sudden it's not that you keep the proportions, but 
but that they change when you change the subset. Okay? But uh, a bit in a nutshell, the idea is to say, uh, oh, we take the confusion matrix and we find a way to try to reweight it. So to try to predict what would be the error um, of, uh, of the humans and uh, any possible choice of prediction set. Okay? And why did we do that? Uh, because of the fact that even if you would have an experiment where you would present to the humans different prediction sets, the amount of prediction sets is going to grow like uh, uh, combinatorially. I mean, it's kind of intractable. If you would have uh, 10 labels, uh, you would have to uh, find prediction sets that is all possible combination of these 10 label values. And that uh, instead of doing that, we just compute the confusion matrix in the original task, and we use this literature on uh, discrete choice models to try to estimate uh, this without actually doing an experiment computing it. Okay. So once we have this uh, estimation now that would say, oh, the probability of success for each possible prediction set, um, what we do is to say, oh, we have a, a set of data that uh, is again representative of the actual distribution. And we say, oh, we compute actually the average success probability of the expert uh, across all this data and all the prediction sets associated to this data. No? And this would be a kind of our estimate uh, of the probability of success for a particular alpha. Okay. And um, a bit the idea is that, okay, this is just a, a Monte Carlo estimate uh, using the estimation set. So you can think, oh, that um, you can have concentration bounds. I mean, here it doesn't really matter, but you can use any standard thing um, to say, oh, to bound your error, assuming the, the model of the uh, multinomial logic is uh, kind of accurate. No? And uh, afterwards, uh, it's just a matter of saying uh, across all these empirical estimates, um, of the success probability for each value of alpha, that remember there are only m, if you have a calibration set of size m, uh, you would choose the one that is uh, the best, no? that you would choose a value of alpha that is uh, maximizing uh, the success probability. Can I ask uh, one question? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, with this multinomial model, uh, the multinomial logic model, uh, I'm still wondering how do you Fit this uh, to data? Do you need like data from the expert, or you're just using the ground truth labels? No, you, in... you, you need data from the expert to uh, you need uh, expert predictions in the original multi-class classification task because it's the thing that you would use to estimate the confusion matrix. Okay. So mm -hmm. in a way, the parameters of the model you need the estimations of I mean predictions from the expert in the original task. And this would be for the training data or the validation data that you use? Uh... Uh, in, in this case, could be uh, actually can be for, from the training data. I mean, as long as a held out set that is not, well, doesn't really matter, can be even from the calibration data. Is uh, uh, This uh, confusion matrix is some aggregated quantity. It's not that you would say you, you pre-compute it in advance, given a data set where you have actual predictions by experts. The data sets I was mentioning here, the calibration Continue. set. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I, I'm back now. I think yeah. my connection was lost uh, for a second. Uh, the, the confusion matrix uh, uh, for the experts is you need some data where you have expert prediction and you know also the true labels of your samples. But this doesn't yeah. have to be exactly the calibration set or doesn't have to be the estimation set or it can be also from them. Okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really matter. But uh, it's, that has to be sufficient to have confidence that the estimation of the confusion matrix is kind of accurate. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Okay. So, um, a bit the, the, the idea now to give you, uh, um, to show you initially, we start with some experiments where we control, uh, let's say, we um, uh, create or simulate experts of different accuracy. And we simulate, uh, we take classifiers of different accuracy. No? And when I say experts of different accuracy, I mean in the original classification task no? without using the system. And um, a bit idea now is that um, what we experiment there is what you see in the left column is that we are uh, considering experts of uh, with different success probability, like 0 0.3, 5, 7, 9, meaning more accurate experts. And what you see on the, on the row, uh, is for the success probability of the classifier on the own. You say, oh, you start with a classifier that is 0 0.3 in terms of accuracy, and then, for example, an expert that is 0 0.3 initially. And a bit idea is that if you use this classifier to build this recommended subset, you optimize your value of alpha, 
and so on. And then you try to say, oh, estimate the success probability of the expert using the system, no? relying on this discrete choice model for, for trying to estimate the expert success probability. And happens, for example, that if you would have that both of them are 0 0.3, in combination, actually, you improve. Okay, that is like in this case would be oh the our estimation is that would be zero forty one the combination of two. Uh, obviously, if it happens that the thing that is also surprising, no, is the uh, one thing that you would say oh if it turns out that the classifier is actually worse than the expert, no. Uh, in this case, if you would say you have a classifier that is zero point three the accuracy. Uh, taking into account here, there are 10 classes, so 0 0.3 is not like, uh, is still to, not like the randomized uh, classifier. But uh, if you would say the expert is uh, much more accurate, like 0 0.7, still you manage to improve a little by saying, oh, by optimizing really the alpha value and so on, you manage that in combination. We estimate that the, the expert using this classifier that is not very accurate would be still 0 0.72. No? And if it happens, say, if you go through all the entire column, uh, most of the times happen that you manage to get some uh, increase in accuracy, independently of whether um, the human is more accurate, the human is less accurate than the classifier, or the classifier is very low accuracy, or the human is low accuracy, and so on. So we find something that is consistent, um, consistently improving. Okay, and to give you a bit more intuition, no, it's like uh, if you would think, oh, we take the alpha that we find in different cases, no, and if you would say. Uh, oh, the expert is more accurate than the classifier uh, when the expert is very accurate, but the classifier has low accuracy. Okay. Or oh, when both the expert and the classifier are very accurate. Okay. If uh, you focus first on the case in the middle, that would mean an expert is very accurate, but the classifier is not. So intuitively there, you would think, oh, if the classifier is not very accurate, but the expert is very accurate, you shouldn't try to use the classifier to simplify a lot of the problem, meaning the prediction sets will not be small, will be many times quite large, because you don't want that uh, you actually impact the performance of a human that alone would be already quite good. So in the end, you end up choosing yeah, the prediction set to be generally larger, so you choose an alpha that is uh, somehow uh, closer to zero, so that you have almost always coverage. On the other hand, if it turns out that the classifier is very accurate, even if the expert is very accurate, you are very confident that even if you choose a small prediction sets, the true label will be inside. So the, the actual configuration of the system and that choosing some alpha that is a lower, or oh, not lower, but even if it is a quite high, the, the average prediction set size uh, will be much smaller. Okay, so that you manage to simplify the task more. Okay. So depending on how accurate the experts and the classifiers are, you end up with different alphas or you end up with different prediction set sizes. Okay. So this is just to give you an intuition with uh, some synthetic examples that we can control the accuracy. Uh, now what we also did now is um, there is a, we, we took a, probably many of you heard about the Cypher 10 uh, data set. So there is a, another data set that is called Cypher 10 H that uh, some of you, I think, even use in their own research, that is basically they pick up uh, some uh, subset of the samples in the Cypher 10, and they let experts to actually uh, predict the labels in this uh, data set. No? And um, to give you a, a bit of an idea is that uh, for each of these images, that is 10,000 natural images, you have label predictions from 50 different experts. Okay? And besides that, you have the true label. So a, a bit the, the idea, no, what we did is to say, oh, since it is a very popular data set, we just took uh, some neural networks, several of them, that they are pretty accurate in this task. No, and we took several of them. And then what we did, no, that uh, I guess Miguel was asking before, is that we use the expert predictions to estimate the confusion matrix of the of the humans um, at predicting these um, these samples. Okay. And uh, what we use this uh, confusion matrix for is to estimate this uh, expert's conditional success probability. Okay. So uh, now here, what the, you see are some results. Now, what you see in this uh, in this column is to say the we take for this uh, ResNet, the PreResNet, and DesNet that they are uh, kind of popular classifiers uh, in these tasks. Um, for these data set, they are very accurate. No, you see here that is over ninety percent accuracy. 
Okay. And this is if you would pick the classifier and you would say, oh, you just um, use it to, to solve this prediction task. Uh, here is what uh, we uh, estimate that our system uh, would uh, enable a, um, an expert uh, using these classifiers and using the prediction sets to achieve as a success probability. No? That in all cases is uh, very high. No? To give you some also some baseline, uh, in this data set, the human uh, annotators that uh, they gather these 50 uh, human predictions per sample. Now, if you compute the success probability of of them is 0 0.947. So this would be the humans alone solving the original classification task. Uh, if you take the classifier, uh, some of the classifier are slightly worse. Uh, some other are slightly uh, better than these humans. But in all these cases, uh, by combining the two, uh, we estimate that you would achieve uh, actually higher uh, accuracy. And uh, regarding the question at the beginning, no, that they were saying, oh, what if you rank um, by confidence and you take uh, or you rank by confidence and in this case we say okay we did that and um, we say oh that the, we also optimize we take the best k value meaning we uh, assume our system but that would always predict the top k and let the expert to choose from this top k but we try many top k values and then we take the best no and if you would do this um, you see that you would still improve um, with respect to the uh, what the expert would do on its own and you would improve with respect to what the classifier would do, but uh, still by always predicting prediction sets of the same size, uh, you lose something. Meaning that if uh, you, you instead use uh, conformal predictions to build the prediction sets and you optimize the value of alpha, you, you achieve the higher accuracy. Okay. And here, like a caveat, no, that this was come next, that uh, somebody would say, that is why I was trying to be careful to say we estimate that this would be the success probability because as uh, maybe I hope was clear from my explanation, but it's like we have a human expert data solving the original classification task. But here, these numbers that I saw is assuming this MNL model that we fit using this uh, confusion matrix, but we didn't really run it to say to show the prediction sets and see what happens. No? But to see uh, in a way how robust are the results, even if the MNL would be completely off. No, even if the way that we are modeling how humans would uh, make errors with prediction sets is completely wrong, we would still uh, like to know, oh, do these results actually are meaningful? No? So um, we did the following. That is to say, um, what we do, no? maybe the expression there is a bit uh, complicated, but maybe it's easier if um, I try to tell you by words. So uh, imagine that you have a... a a human know that the confusion matrix we are pretty certain is uh, accurate because was estimated using real data. No? And uh, what we do here is to say um, at the uh, test time, uh, when we are trying to uh, somehow estimate what is the success probability given a prediction set, um, we add some noise parameter P that what it means is that in the worst case, when P is equal one, would mean that uh, even if we reduce the the prediction set is smaller than the all possible set of label values. We assume that the errors that a human would do, if p is equal one, would still make them, even if it turns out that these errors were labels that we remove, um, that they are not in the prediction set. So we, in theory, if we ask the human to pick a label from the prediction set, uh, even if we say, oh well, uh, sure, even if we remove a label that the human would have chosen, uh, we assume that. Um, will never choose the right label, would choose a still a mistake from the prediction set. No? And that the confusion matrix for this uh, label that is still in the prediction set uh, would go even to a higher value. So in a way, what I'm saying is that for this noise model, if P is equal one, the system would only help if it turns out uh, uh, predicts a single tone, predicts the true label. Because if it predicts the true label and we ask the human to pick one label from the prediction set, we know there's only one element, so it's not going to make a mistake. But uh, in all the other cases, if P is equal one, we assume the expert would act as if uh, there was no system. No? So that is like a, a very conservative uh, estimate of performance because would mean even if we are completely wrong in how the experts actually improve their uh, error when we saw a prediction set. And the thing that is uh, surprising now in synthetic happens that uh, for uh, P-values that are until quite high, 
Um, it still would happen that the expert alone uh, will do worse than, let's say, an expert using our system, accounting for the fact that now in the estimation of performance, we are saying our model is really wrong. Okay? Uh, but eventually it would happen that uh, oh, the expert actually uh, could be still that is data off without the system in the synthetic data. No? But this uh, example in particular is uh, one example in which the classifiers are not very accurate. No? But if you take the real data, um, somehow the classifiers that you saw before, they always have accuracy over 90%. So because they are very accurate, happens that many times the samples, the prediction set that we recommend are singletons. They are just, they contain the true label. And for that reason happens that even if uh, our model is completely wrong, that means P is equal one, um, it still would happen that the, the performance would still be higher for an expert using the system than the expert alone, okay? And this is counting that our modeling of the expert is completely wrong, no? That is, um, that always the prediction sets uh, will never really help the humans not to make mistakes, except when we actually recommend only the true label. Okay. So in a way, this uh, P equal one is a, a system in which you would say uh, you only let the, the algorithm to predict whenever the prediction set is a singleton, and otherwise you let the human predict on their own, no, without any kind of a system because you would say, oh, you are just assuming the error wouldn't improve. And I guess that is, um, um, that is uh, somehow a setting that uh, I think some of you here, I think Uman um, work uh, on some paper that uh, somehow they hint that this idea of using conformal prediction to do um, um, like um, deferral to say, oh, that uh, in combination with saying, oh, if the prediction set uh, has high size, you just allow the expert to predict on their own. If it is low size, you, you just show the prediction set. So it's kind of, and they actually did an empirical study where they actually deploy a system and they found some gain. So this is uh, consistent with that kind of result, yeah. no? That in so, this case, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually had a quick question. Uh, thank you for, for mentioning our work and we really enjoyed your work as well. Um, just just two things to clarify, I guess. So in our work, we would learn a threshold. I think you guys use the nomenclature Q, right? So we would learn yeah. a Q such that after a particular queue, we would defer back to the human. But just for these simulations, you're using the CIFAR-10H to estimate and like to synthesize these experts, right? Um, yeah. As opposed to running them on, got it. Okay, just to clarify. Exactly. And then, yeah. and then it, it, does it, did, did you guys ever play around with like potentially like, so Katie, who I think is also on the call, is, we've been doing some stuff around soft labels as well. Um, particularly, do you guys find that if you like hold out some experts, like some who are like particularly bad, how these systems degrade? So this is something we haven't played around with, but like some of these CIFAR 10H labelers tend to be like not bad, but they're 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 uh, far from the average annotator, right? So there's 50 annotators per image. If we were to hold out a particular annotator and provide this system to them, like how does your system perform? Basically, we're thinking about systems like noise. I think right now you're saying we can add noise to the experts' predictions. I'm saying that. We just take a bad expert and we try to provide them with um, these types of tools. Did you guys ever explore that, like the expert quality to some extent? Um, we didn't. I mean, that is a good point. Is that um, here, rather than to try to assess oh, the sensitivity of our evaluation to oh, whether the expert is very bad, was more the sensitivity whether our model of the expert is very bad. Um, but I yeah. agree it would be interesting to say, oh, if you have a system that you tune it in a way using multiple experts and you say, oh, this is the average system. And then afterwards, somehow this average system is tuned towards these outliers. Uh, that is a good point. And I think that yeah. should happen. Yeah. Uh, it's just something we've been a little curious about and then thinking about like how, you pretend, like how that potentially change your, your scheme of, uh, of, of developing these conformal sets. And so you basically our estimate of the contusion matrix for this individual would be bad. And then basically you could potentially bound like yeah. how far away our contusion matrix is. Uh, yeah, the population yeah, yeah. one is from the back expert. Yeah. yeah, you could do that. Yeah, in reality, you could say, oh, even this confusion matrix, you can have it kind of personalized both to, to you know, both to an expert in particular or both to certain samples. Because here also the confusion matrix that we use for the multinomial logic, we assume that all the samples all right. with the same prediction set will be equally difficult. 
but uh, we have some additional things where we try to first actually we use the confidence um, you know the variability in the expert predictions to identify samples that uh, they seem more difficult or the experts disagree and then we I use see. those samples to say build a confusion matrix let's say of difficult samples and in reality you could afterwards just say oh that uh, you would use it in your estimation of success probability uh -huh. and in that way you would arrive to a different somehow different values of alpha that uh, you would say oh take into account that uh, you can stratify the samples per difficulty first so that yeah the whole thing assuming we have a good way of me measuring that which maybe uncertainty is probably the natural way of doing that but yeah that's yeah. really cool yeah. thank you so much thank you yeah i, I just actually, one thing i just want to point out uh, about the time uh, we have a few minutes left but i don't know how much uh, um, you, I, you I'm almost to done. Much I, 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 i'm almost okay. done. <laughs> good yeah it's uh, just was the last thing, but even I was mentioning now that we did these additional things of saying, oh, if you stratify samples per difficulty and you compute confusion matrices and this MNL per difficulty and you use all that to say, oh, you use a bit of an expert model that is slightly more complex. And it's just as a matter of saying another kind of sensitivity analysis or saying, oh, the results seem to hold also for this model. No, so, but it's a way of saying since we didn't do an empirical study or a user study is to try to assess the robustness of the results to different variations to see if um, yeah, the whole thing is not just made up. And uh, just to, to conclude, no, like um, how do we go from here? No, I guess something we are working on is in uh, some follow up to say, oh, to actually deploy these things in with uh, real human experts is something that Uman did in, in a paper, but somehow they were not. Uh, uh, has a lot of value that but on, on the other hand they were not optimizing this alpha or they were not trying to tune the system at least not in the way we do so we are trying to to do that with a slightly different formulation uh, and also there are uh, many questions in decision support systems about what is the expert actually observing from the data or what is the classifier observing from the data so you could think oh there is a, a lot of unmeasured confounding that uh, maybe the expert is aware of some modality of data but the classifier is not so things like oh distribution shift could happen also in that domain and uh, in this setting we focus also in this kind of single step task that is quite the idealized the scenario for decision making but there are uh, other settings that you would say is more like a sequential multi-step task that is uh, something we are also uh, thinking about and um, just to conclude no this is a uh, yeah quite recent work but we have an archive preprint and the code is also online and here is a photo of the, the students that were behind this work. Um, and also, I have to say, look, I think it's in the job market this year. He's a PhD student in Cornell University, but was doing an uh, internship in, in my group. Um, so just if you want a, a very good uh, grad student, uh, I encourage uh, you to reach out to him. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about uh, our research, you can see uh, uh, our website there, or you can just ping me via email if uh, you want to comment on, on anything. And th thanks a lot. Good, thanks a lot. We may have time for some quick question uh, from the audience. Does anyone want to ask uh, anything? I actually have one question if no one wants to ask something. I'm interested about this multinomial uh, logic model. Obviously, it's quite simple because it's only using the the, the labels, no? how, how the probabilities change from uh from the class uh and my question is did you try to actually maybe use some more complicated model there i can imagine you could also use some uh, features from the input uh maybe the last layer of the trained network could be used to condition condition on that yeah. maybe just to to see have you thought about anything like that um the, the only thing we did is this thing that i was mentioning of saying oh you first uh, segment the the samples in terms of oh, how accurate are the actual expert in the original cl classification task. But you could imagine to try to do something that is um, more like, oh, that uh, you try to uh, have some more like a fine grain uh, kind of modeling. But one thing that is actually, I'm not sure would be that, that helpful, is that in a way, what we are trying to compute or estimate is the average success probability of an expert using the system. Mm -hmm. And for that, we only have to know, okay, what is the average success probability for each prediction set? Mm -hmm. But for okay. that, doesn't yeah. help you a lot to say, well, sure, even if uh, you would be able to compute more accurately for a particular prediction set, after you take the average across all samples with a given prediction set, 
then the result would be kind of, I mean, would be the same as, as long yeah. as you are accurate at just predicting this prediction set. And yeah. it, in a way, we also feel more confident that the, that kind of estimation um, to assume something about the average um, success probability for a prediction set is a much um, easier, let's say, to buy than to say, oh, we, we assume something at a very fine grain level. Mm -hmm. No, uh, our assumption is only about oh this average error, um, you know, like uh, of prediction sets, not uh, specifically of samples. Good. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, so thanks a lot, Manuel, for joining uh, the seminar, and thanks also to all our audience. Uh, see you soon in the next seminar. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. You. Bye. Bye.